After my release from the prison in Salzburg, I was joined by my faithful secretary, Operinus. We travelled north to the Danube. There we headed west along its valleys. I was surprised by the warmth of the welcome given us by the villagers. Most of them seemed to have heard of me, and some gave us food and lodgings. Others brought their sick ones out for me to tend. Operinus had told me of a wondrous German pastor from Basel, Ecolampadius, a humanist who, unlike Luther, had compassion for the peasants and the Anabaptists. Out of humanity, I too was forced to side with the Anabaptists, who dared to read the scriptures in their own tongue and to worship in their own fashion, spurning what was strictly Catholic and conservative Protestantism. For this, they were cruelly persecuted. Ecolampadius, whose territory I was now entering, gave them succour, preaching to them where they huddled in their wrecked churches and defending them in their burning villages. You suffer now, my brethren. You are sore distressed by the enemy on all sides. They burn your homes and mutilate your men. You suffer now in war, but it will not always be so. One day, the prophet Isaiah has said it. One day, man will beat his sword into plowshares and his spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not always lift sword against nation, nor shall the nations learn war anymore. Master, do you hear that? It's a warning from the village. They must be in trouble. Operinus, go and get help. I saw a group of horsemen passing through that valley a short while ago. They may be friendly. that have even greater need of me. Stay with us. Don't leave us. against my person, and the wrath of seven princes fall upon your head. Princes whom these hands have saved from the grave. I'm a doctor. I've come to help. He is, too. I know him. He's Paracelsus. Oh, doctor, my daughter's in that house, and she won't come out. She's quite possessed. Shush, woman. <laughs> your daughter is in a state of grace. <laughs> My God is an all-consuming fire. My God is an all-consuming fire. Who is that? 
that? He's a doctor, sir. Our men folk are away. And he comes up and rushes straight into the burning houses. Badly burned they were. Paracelsus, he's tending to him. Gather yourselves together, my dears. My men are here. They will protect you and take you to our encampment. You men, organize some litters and take the doctor's patients into Freiburg. Staunch Catholic tending the wounds of Anabaptist heretics. Surely that's a job for Protestants like me. I'm neither Catholic nor Protestant nor pickled pumpkin. I'm Paracelsus, and I tend the sick and dying wherever they may be and whoever they are. You are alone, Paracelsus. It's a dangerous time to be by yourself. I work better alone. But for this piece of infamy, I would have been in Strasbourg by now. I'm seeking an academic post, somewhere to publish my books. I will become a citizen of Strasbourg. They will recognize my surgical and medical degrees. And you'll find plenty of humanists like yourself there. Fare you well, Paracelsus. I feel we may meet again shortly. My dear Vandalimus, you have a new student of some fame. He is attracted to your public dissections. You mean Paracelsus? Well, he is German and is apparently taken with my lecturing in German and with your writing a book in it instead of Latin. I think you'll find his interest is more than that. He would like to do some lecturing himself. Indeed. I know of no vacancy in the Department of Anatomy. Nor is there one in surgery, at least not for him. This young turkey cock is up to something. He says he would like to lecture on living chemistry, I think he called it, uh, whatever that means. The chemistry of living things. Yes. I hear he has a morbid fascination with the passage of food through the body, wants to examine the changes it undergoes down the path to the intestines. Damn perversion, I call it. Yes, well, he would have many opportunities to observe the phenomenon in soldiers dying of shrapnel wounds, wounds in the stomach, you know, bowels hanging out and that sort of thing. Yes. I heard that only last week he'd been sewing up the heads of Anabaptist heretics and peasant anarchists in that fracas down south. Well, he's another one of these humanists. They're always up to something. This damned university is full of them. Paracelsus is a busybody and a know-all. He needs his wings clipping. Now, see if I can't arrange a public debate with him on a point of anatomy. I'll give him a thorough whipping. He'll soon be discredited. While Herr Munster is removing the superficial tissues from our cadaver, perhaps some of you would want to ask questions? Ah, our newcomer, Paracelsus, hot foot from the field of slaughter. Dr. Hogg, is there really anything to be learned from the anatomy of the dead? Can it tell us anything about nature and the natural order of things? 
Surely the dead fragments we're examining today cannot tell us what moves the blood in its vessels, what shortens the muscles in their contractions, what makes us think and feel. What we need to know is withheld from us because the parts we are looking at are dead. But student surgeons must have some starting point, Paracelsus. And what better is there than a pliant cadaver? Yes. 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 The corpse cannot answer you back. <laughs> Alas, the real anatomy of man has never been dealt with. It is the anatomy of the living body, not the dead one. The anatomy of health and disease is to be found in the living body, not in a corpse, and certainly not in the teachings of ancients like Galen. Are you aware that today's most celebrated anatomist, Senor de Carpi, has completed the dissection of more than a hundred heads and has found dozens of bones and muscles not even mentioned in Galen's books, into which these students must dip their heads like crows digging into carrion. <laughs> Senor de Carpi is so embarrassed by his discoveries, he has to pretend that the mistakes in Gallen's books are printer's errors. Perhaps you field surgeons have a reasonable fear of opening the dead body. It could so easily expose the surgical mistakes you perpetrate on your victims. Yeah. Oh, very droll. You have an upper limb in your hands. It is only a part of the whole. It can tell us nothing about the unfortunate one from whom it was taken. His hopes and aspirations, the fears that rent him, and the joys that lifted him. It tells us nothing of his diseases or even of his good health. Surely it would be very much better to examine a living body, to feel for its pulsating health at the wrist to draw blood from the fossa at his elbow, to know where to apply a ligature to stop the limb from hemorrhaging. Why, only last week I had an occasion to dress a gunshot wound of the shoulder. Yes, Dr. Hohenheim. We are aware of your many experiences of surgery on the battlefield, but I would remind you that this is a dissection seminar yeah. and not a war veterans reunion. Fascinating though some may find your reminiscences. I must ask you not to interrupt our dissection with your impertinences and irrelevances. I was merely stressing the irrelevance of a corpse to its living counterpart. If you wish to make some useful contribution to the dissection of the upper limb, Paracelsus, then perhaps in a moment, when we are through with this dissection of the forearm, you will describe, for the edification of the class, the ramifications of the blood vessels in the hand. In fact, I will be happy to debate them with you. Meanwhile, Herr Munster, conclude your demonstration. The brachial muscle covers the elbow joint. What is it, Ophrenus? You are being summoned to Basel. Robinus, the revered humanist and publisher, is dying. The whole city is beside itself with grief. He is so popular, but no one can help him. Frobin has a malignant infection of the leg. Yes, and the medical guild advises amputation. That wouldn't save him. I must leave immediately. He's far too precious a person to lose. Now, Operinus, go and hire me the fleetest horse you can. I'll collect my instruments together and meet you in the south gate in half an hour. Come on to Basel later with the baggage. I will go at once. Now, Paracelsus, you will open our debate on the blood supply to the hand. <laughs> the bird is flown. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Raven cannot stand the stench of a fresh corpse. First blow to me, I think. Many times I abandoned medicine and followed other pursuits, but I was always driven back to it. The art of medicine, if it is truly practiced, is certain and whole, and the whole part of the man must be treated, 
not just his bodily parts. There is nothing in it which should be attributed to evil spirits or even to chance, not if it is truly tested. It should always restore health to the sick. So this was my vow. To perfect my medical art and never to swerve from it so long as God granted me office. And I will oppose all false medicine and teachings. I will love the sick, each and every one of them, more than if my own body were at stake. I will not diagnose except by symptoms. I will not administer a medicine without first understanding the disease. And I will not collect a fee without first working for it. I will not trust any apothecary. I will do no violence to any child. I shall aim to know and not to guess. This is my vow. Hieronymus. <laughs> 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 Uh, keep those jackals away from me. They would dismember me piece by piece. Gentlemen, please, leave us. Sweet Your Honor, must take them to the parlor. They offend us both. I would speak with your father alone. It's got to go. It's got to go. Come, sir. Oh. Johannes. My heart is torn in twain. The one half sides with you and rejects with rank disgust the surgeon's waiting knife. The other would see you live, though halved in mass in spirit stoutly undiminished. Grieve not, frail one. Their sores here even now, with the same wind that rustles yonder trees. One Aureolus, my deliverer. The golden one? You mean? Paracelsus. Theophrastus Hohenheim. Even he. Who's there? Brunswick, what's the name of? Brunswick. I was pacing the cloisters and saw a light. I was wondering who could be working at such a late hour. What keeps you so busy? How did you get in? You seem to forget. I have a bunch of keys. I rarely use them, but as head of faculty, it is my entitlement. Oh, yes, yes, of course. I have some work to do on a specimen before tissue destruction occurs. It's often very rapid with kidneys. That's true. Have you taken the kidneys out? Oh. No doubt about it. Died from kidney failure. Some have it that... Uh... You scored a victory over young Paracelsus yesterday, Hock. No. Oh, yes, I think so. It is whispered that in the middle of it all, he was called away to Basel to treat Froben. <laughs> Contrived, no doubt. Contrived. Aren't you being a little vindictive? 
I have looked into that young man's records. He's obviously skilled in surgery, but it seems that he has explored new fields in medicine, too. He's no innovator. I don't know about that. It seems he is curing venereal diseases, and that takes a bit of doing. Pure luck. The man's a charlatan. Everything he does is suspect. Oh, come, come, Hawk. The man has some sound ideas. Such as what, pray? Well, for instance, sometimes he spends months in the hills treating all comers and in places where there are no apothecaries, and yet he never seems to carry large stocks of remedy. Uh -huh. People have remarked on it. It seems to bear out his proposition that only minute doses are ever needed. So long as they're sufficiently purified, they are effective. He even states they are more effective than larger doses. What nonsense. You really are severe. I would even say unreasonable in your judgment of him. Well, I will let you get on with your work. Good night, Hawk. Good night. It's sad about Froben. A good friend. A good publisher. I hope Paracelsus can help him. Master Frobin, we must delay matters no longer. Your father is nearing death. We must send for the surgeons. You've delayed us for three days now. You will not amputate until I hear from Paracelsus. Your father is entering a coma from which he is unlikely to recover. It's a week now since you took it into your heads to send for Paracelsus. He's not here. And I doubt very much if he will be. He will come. And gentlemen, let me remind you that he is both surgeon and physician and well capable of healing my father. I don't think that you understand. There can be no healing here. The foot is almost black. I don't doubt that when your father fell, he cut the flesh almost to the bone. The infection is very deep. Now, Master Frobin, I'm well aware that you belong to a group of scholars with progressive ideas that like to call themselves humanists. Well, I am not one of them. I will not have such irresponsibility in the field of medicine, still less in matters of faith. I will not allow a madman like Luther to obtrude his ideas into the sick room. Gentlemen, in a moment you will have an opportunity to meet the Luther of Medicine himself, Paracelsus. <laughs> the Luther of Medicine. Hieronymus, your father will sleep now for several hours, but I need your help. Nurse, cut those bandages very carefully from the patient's leg. Remove those stinking balsams. The wound must be exposed to the air whenever possible.
The odour from the limb gave me the sign I was looking for. The flesh was not yet dead. Froben's leg could be saved. Nurse, bring me a basin of hot water and some lint. This wound needs cleansing. Hieronymus, how far can we trust this old nurse? You can trust her with everything, except a secret. I thought as much. Amputation will not be necessary. <sighs> Healing will proceed apace. Thank God I arrived in time. Hieronymus, you will see some strange things administered here today in the name of treatment. Do not be over-concerned. I have to protect my methods from every doctor, apothecary, and nurse. Here I have a list for the apothecary. I have purposely made it a long one. In reality, I only need two of these items, though I dare not order them alone. If I did, every doctor and apothecary in this city would know what was in my list. I have included many items so as to confuse them. I quite understand. I will replace these dressings every four hours throughout the night. Nurse, you may go home now to rest. Return at dawn. I would like you to wash the patient and air this room. Good night, nurse. Come, Paracelsus. We've prepared you a private room adjoining this one. And I have a hot bath and fresh set of clothes for you. The master's much better, sir. Even has his own colour back again. Yes, I've given him a wash down and the fever is gone. And Dr. Pat Zelsky, he said the master slept all through the night again. Oh, in three days I've seen his leg all bruised and horrible, turn white. Oh, it's a miracle. <laughs> and he's still fast asleep, but it won't hurt just to sit by the bed. The doctor took a walk down to the river when I arrived. He'll be back in a moment. Oil of mastic, pound of antimony, juice of white tartar, land six. What next? Oil of myrtles, pound of aloe, white vinegar. Heavens, which of these does he put on the master's wound? None of those, old nurse. I have here something else for that. Fresh from the river bank. Hieronymus, the news is good. Your father's pulse is stronger, the fever is gone, and the poison is abating. Mm. You must be Boniface Amelbach. You were two years junior to me when we were at Basel College here. Heavens, was it really ten years ago? <laughs> Hello, Theophrastus. You once poured a flagon of Bordeaux over my head. <laughs> Holy Mary. You must have been round the world since then. Oh, I, and not with Magellan. Oh, man. The last I heard of you, you were in Moscow. Weren't you captured by the Tartars there? Oh, yes. Some captivity. I didn't resent it a bit. I had the time of my life. I did hear that the authorities nearly strung you up last year. That was a bad one, the Peasants' Revolt. Well, it hasn't stopped the sale of your books in this city, Paracelsus. They're still as popular as ever. Yes. It was last Christmas Eve. I shall not forget the part Luther played in that massacre. Uh, you'll not find things too pleasant in this city either. 
What have you been up to? Your boots are soaking. I've been down to the fishermen at the riverbank. I've brought back a remedy, a very special remedy, which will set the apothecaries in this town on a roar for a decade to come. What have you there? Worms. Worms? Yes. Fisherman's bait. Excellent for festering wounds. Holy mother of God. Wash these agents, old nurse, and place them on some fresh lint. We must be very careful not to allow any of my medical secrets to get out. Cleansing a wound with worms is a very ancient method, known only to the highest savants. The knowledge of this could command a high price among the town's doctors and apothecaries. No one must say a word of this outside this room. my beloved son has gone. How you managed to stave off those wolves from their butchery, I'll never know. <laughs> Greetings, Boniface. I had thought my last discourse with you would be about my will and testament. Paracelsus, my good friend, my life is yours to command. Stay with us in this city. And I will see that your works continue to receive the care and acclaim due to them. Nurse, go you to the market and bring me some fresh fruit. I'm hungry. May I, Paracelsus? Paracelsus, you're a tease. I was dozing just now. I heard you up to your pranks. Worms, indeed. <laughs> I was told quite definitely in Strasbourg that there was a confrontation between Paracelsus and Dr. Hock in a public lecture, and that on some matter of anatomy, Paracelsus backed down. Well, I'm not surprised. He's quite undisciplined. Mm. The other day at Frobin's, his handling of the patient was quite alarming. There's his nurse. Yes. I know the old piece of Callion is up to. It's lucky she doesn't come up for licensing with me. Excitable old windbag. I bet she's going to fetch the surgeons. I told you amputation was inevitable. Too damn late now, of course. Should have done it three days ago when I was there. See if you can find out anything, apothecary. Out with it. What is it? Speak up. Robin is better. The wound is keen and healing fast. What? Mm. It's true. She came out to buy some pears, his favourite fruit. Shut up the shop for an hour. Put a card in the window while I'm away. Maggots on sale live. Are you mad? Where are you going? Maggots. Paracelsus used maggots on Froben. I'm going to the riverbank. Pull yourself together, man. Herr Franz, you're acting like a lunatic. I'd remind you that you are an apothecary in a position of trust. I've noticed with increasing alarm the rubbish that you've started selling. Distilled mineral salts, hellebore, and these books. 
so-called humanist ideas, reformed and free thinking. It has got to stop. Leave me alone. I'll think what I like. This is the work of that religious renegade. Echo Lampadius. Fill their heads with nonsense. Quite right, quite right. Worms, indeed. Theophrastus. Cacophrastus! Erasmus, I'm glad we are alone. Dear friend, we have done so much together. And you have a lot more to accomplish still. I worry for you and your health and your strength. You worry over me. I've been beside myself concerned for you. Without you, I could not have gone on. Gentle Erasmus, please do not grieve at what I have to say. Paracelsus has pulled me back from the abyss, but he cannot keep me from it. I have very little time left, maybe six months, a year, hardly more than that. I want to live out my days as robustly as I can, not as an invalid. But Johannes... No, let me finish. I need some months to straighten out my affairs so that the young ones can take up the work fresh and organized. It is imperative that you preserve yourself and act as the cohesive force when I am gone. I want you to let Paracelsus see you. The man is a wondrous doctor, a prince among physicians. Please let him examine you. Our hearts surely beat as one. I have already written a letter to the blessed doctor. Here, I will leave it with you. Erasmus, I'm glad of this. We must keep Paracelsus here in Basel. He will grow impatient and leave unless he has important work to do. I will speak with Echo Lampadius. Perhaps I can buy a house for Paracelsus as part of his fee. There's that beautiful house with a basement where he can do his experiments. Rhinespring, I believe it is called. Face, dear boy. You surely can't have brought more legal documents for my signature. Hmm. Last night, I sensed or dreamt that you brought a whirlwind through my door. Instead, you bring me a nosegay. Your muse was right. I have left the whirlwind downstairs and wafted you here the attar of these roses. It should make the weight of these legal matters lighter. What whirlwind? Oh, Columpedius. He is downstairs with Throben now, but seeks your advice as well. He never seeks my advice. My stamp. My seal of approval. <laughs> Luther. Swingley. Echolampadius. They only want to use me. To throw the weight of my reputation, my learning behind the forces of their bias. Whereas I, as a humanist, would give my love equally to all humanity. You are probably right, but I believe he sincerely wants to avoid bloodshed here in Basel. Oh, would that that were true. I wonder what urges men to such a pitch of madness that they will make any effort, incur any expense, meet the greatest of dangers in order that they may kill each other in war. We spend our lives at war. We are no better than the wild beasts that fight among themselves, and yet they use only nature's weapons, not these diabolical machines of war, and they fight only to defend themselves or for their food or to defend their young. Oh, Boniface. 
Despite our own humanitarian presence in the city, the religious bickering here is becoming intolerable. I have warned Echolampadius that I shall flee the city if there is any violence. Both Catholics and Protestants are equally to blame. Oh, this viciousness frets my pygmy body to decay. War is sweet only to those that know it not. And I, alas, know it only too well. I remember. In Bologna, Julius, the old pope, entering the city at the head of his victorious troops. It was the most disgusting spectacle I ever saw. I vouch the old fox did not enter heaven so easily. Oh, do not fret yourself, sir. I suppose he was no worse than that brigand with the flaming red hair that called me a chameleon in public <laughs> because I would not side with either of the factions warring for control of Basel. He actually called me a pernicious enemy of the gospel. Ludwig Barr, yes. Yes, but O'Connor and Pedis expelled them from Basel the same day. There. He heeded you then. He'll heed you now. I had a pupil, Boniface. His name? Alexis Stewart. His father? Scotland's king. I never loved a youthful intellect as much as his. He died in battle at Flodden. The antique ring he gave me bore this seal. Youth and death yield to no one. They alone are eternal. He was a bastard son, like me. His youth in war gave way to death. See, from it, I made my seal and called it Terminus. Oh, bunny face, this world is too much with me. Oh, beloved Erasmus, <laughs> Econ Penius is here to talk to you about Paracelsus. He's a plan to keep him in battle. <laughs> Paracelsus. Now there is an alpha to anyone's omega. <laughs> It's all going too fast, Echolampadius, much too fast. Why can you reformers not leave it to the gentle processes of enlightenment, scholarship and the printing press? The changes you demand can only lead to more violence. There will be violence if they are not introduced soon. The changes we ask for, insist upon, barely keep up with the cries of reform from our guilds of craftsmen. I don't want violence. We cannot have rabid papists like Ludwig Barr going round the town inciting action against our hard-won reforms. Even our town physician, Dr. Vonnecker, whom you know well, and whose salary we pay for out of our own pockets, rams his papism down our throats. It simply will not do. Every morning I am besieged with outraged parishioners who have been visited by Dr. Vonnecker on his sick rounds, outraged at his condemnation of our hard-won reforms. What can we do about it? We must replace these old mule heads with progressive thinkers and humanists. The city council have had enough. The aldermen have already struck Dr. Vonnecker off the payroll. We need a new town physician. Someone who is competent as well as enlightened. Someone who can heal the sick without upsetting the whole community. Well, go ahead. Appoint one. Why do you come to me? I, I'm not well and all this worry over Froben. Good Erasmus, I wouldn't bother you for a moment if Froben were well enough to advise me. But he is not, and there is a problem. What is it, dear boy? The post of city physician carries with it, as you know, a teaching post at the university. Professor of medicine. The Catholic stronghold at the university, which is very powerful, has rejected the right of our Protestant counselors to dismiss one of their professors. We have a nasty tangle on our hands. It could lead to violence. Neither side will give in. 
I'm sure you have the solution, Echolampadius. What is it you wish me to confirm? We must find someone who fits the bill. Someone who will be acceptable to both Catholics and Protestants. Well, there is only one person who could conceivably fulfill that role. I mean, of course, Paracelsus. Exactly. For well, once, we are in absolute accord, but tarry a moment. I must insist on one thing. Paracelsus is a brilliant doctor, a brilliance matched only by his excellence as a lecturer, but he is also a most spiritual person, ill-equipped for politics. He's far too straightforward and outspoken for that. I do not want him used as a pawn in the politics of this city, Echolampadius. You have my assurance. I will spare him that. You've seen the worth of this man yourself. Paracelsus needs a home, a place to conduct his experiments, to see his patients, and above all, to write his books. Froben has offered to buy just such a house for him, but Froben, bless him, is already heavily extended, financing this publishing house. Erasmus, I am as much concerned for Paracelsus as you. I will see that the city provides him with just such an establishment. Then you have my blessing. 